Okay, Dave and I are going to divide our remarks in the following way. I'll describe the framework we developed for our analysis, and then David is going to fill in the framework with, a, with the, the manner in which this applies to NCLB policy. <clears throat> our general charge from Bill Mathis was to investigate the effects of NCLB on democratic control of local schooling and on, on education for democracy and civic virtue. It's pretty clear to us that NCLB has diminished local control. What is not clear, at least a priori, is whether this is a good or bad thing. Many people think it's a good thing, I think. But whether it's a good or a bad thing depends on its rationale and effects. Local control is the justification for racial segregation, for instance, cannot be plausibly defended on democratic grounds. <clears throat> The same reasoning can be extended to the spectrum of educational law and policy regarding income, disability, gender, and language that followed in the wake of the Brown decision. <laughs> On the other hand, democracy presumes local control as a starting point and places a burden on those who would curtail it to provide a justification for doing so. <clears throat> in order to set down the general criteria for determining when curtailing local control is indeed justified, we appeal to the celebrated theory of Amy Gutman from Democratic Education. <clears throat> At the center of Gutman's theory is the idea of democratic citizens effectively participating in what she calls social conscious reproduction, conscious social reproduction, rather than just social reproduction. We've got theories about how people are just reproduced. She emphasizes that we must be able to engage consciously in how our society proceeds. <clears throat> This applies to the way democratic decision-making should go, the way democratic decisions should be made about schooling. It also applies to the education we should provide to students within our schools. <clears throat> Slide five. Five's up. up. OK. In order to foster these conceptions of democratic governance and education for democratic citizenship, Gutman places three principled constraints on democratic discretion, non-repression, non-discrimination, in the democratic education threshold. Non-repression and non-discrimination are pretty straightforward. Non-repression involves ensuring that all voices are heard. Non-discrimination involves ensuring that various groups are not excluded from deliberations. <clears throat> and the children aren't excluded from the correct kind of education. The democratic threshold is a particular interpretation of educational quality that speaks to the question, questions of what is to be equalized and how equal is equal enough. <clears throat> Regarding what is to be equalized, Gutman restricts herself to the knowledge, skills, and dispositions associated with effective participation in conscious social reproduction. <clears throat> There's nothing preventing her from adding things like being prepared for gainful employment. She does follow Dewey, for example, who indeed includes the issue of people being prepared for work. Not in any narrow way, but in general, being prepared for work. <clears throat> Regarding how equal is equal enough, if you're familiar, familiar with the equality versus adequacy debate regarding funding, uh, Gutman holds an adequacy view. <clears throat> the difference between thresholds and adequacy, of course, is that threshold and adequacy conceptions involve a substantive criterion of equality, whereas equality standards involve a relative standard of equality. <clears throat> now, that said, David will now talk about the degree to which NCLB lives up to these principles. <clears throat> so in applying this framework to the question of evaluating some of the effects of NCLB on uh, democratic education and democratic policymaking in education, um, let's see, my clicker can, oh, I got it. So um, Ken mentioned earlier that we would assess this in terms of the rationale and the effects of the policy vis-a-vis um, -vis this framework of democratic uh, policymaking and education. So um, following uh, Patrick McGuinn and some other authors, uh, we an, an looked at the um, rationale for no NCLB in what's been termed the accountability regime. Um, under the accountability regime, local control is actually viewed as part of the problem that's to be overcome through education reform. No Child Left Behind seeks to increase adult expectations, motivation, and effort. It assumes that inequality is the result of a lack of commitment 
by the people who live or work in low-income communities of color. And we're all familiar with the way in which the NCLB um, was passed and understood as a equity-oriented reform. Just even the title of the bill, No Child Left Behind, um, has this resonance of equalizing educational opportunities, even outcomes. So um, under the accountability regime, this is interpreted as a the inequality is interpreted as a failure of adults in low-income and minority communities to serve the children in their own communities. Um, thus, the key policy lever to promote educational equity is not better resources more fairly distributed, but rather behavioral prompts in the form of public exposure followed by incentives or more likely punishments. Um, this is from a book by Oaks Rogers and Lipton called Learning Power. So according to Pauline Lipman, um, NCLB is a highly racialized discourse of deficits. So that's in terms of the rationale. Um, in terms of the effects, we can see that communities already disadvantaged and marginal have been further disempowered in terms of influencing um, reform policies. And two specific um, policy instruments, supplemental educational services and school choice policies, depending on the state, those um, come into effect in the second or third year that a school or district fails to make an adequate yearly progress. Um, and both of those instruments can be seen to disempower already marginalized communities in terms of um, participating in deliberation about how their school is to be reformed. And even more dramatically, restructuring reconstitution and closures, which come into effect further down the line with um, more consecutive years of failure to make adequate yearly progress. So this is way down here. You can't read it probably, most of you. Um, a quotation from a teacher in the San Diego school district. Um, we felt reform was being done to us, not with us. Given the framework that Ken has um, elaborated before me here, um, you can see that that seems to run afoul of one of Gutman's criteria, which is one, non-discrimination, and to non-repression, those two principles. Non-repression says that people shouldn't feel that they don't have agency, they don't have um, a role and a voice in the process, and the fact that already marginalized communities are disproportionately targeted by these policy instruments, they're disproportionately subject to these sanctions, that seems to run afoul of Gutman's principle of non-discrimination. So um, the second question, that this is broad brushstrokes, and hopefully in the discussion we can get into some more of the details of this. I'm just kind of trying to put the, the skeleton that we can kind of flesh out um, in discussion. Moving on from democratic policy making to democratic, the question of democratic education, NCLB has had, over the past decade, anti-democratic effects upon the content of education, the actual curriculum that is being taught in schools, and also on the context of education the context in which instruction and schooling occurs. So I'll say something about each of these in turn. Um, regarding the content of democratic education, we've seen a narrowing of the curriculum. Um, Ken mentioned that Gutman defines the democratic threshold in terms of skills, dispositions, and knowledge associated with um, being able to participate in the democratic conscious social reproduction of society. So in terms of the knowledge necessary for that conscious social reproduction, um, we've seen that non-basic subjects, basics defined as reading, writing, and mathematics primarily with um, science as a sort of a oh, ways down the line, but lip service at least. Um, so non-basic subjects have been squeezed out. And for example, in middle school, the Center for Education Policy found that uh, the increase in time spent on math and English was on average 42%. And this increased focus on the basics means that other subjects have had to give. At the elementary level, 44% of districts have reduced time since the since NCLB went into effect. 44% of districts have reduced time in one or more subjects or activities, including social studies, science, art, and music, physical education, lunch, and recess. Some of these are more pertinent to the knowledge um, and skills necessary to conscious social reproduction than others, but lunch and recess are also very important. Um, okay, so and predictably, again, the impact has been greatest on districts and schools identified for improvement by NCLB, which are disproportionately 
communities that are already disadvantaged, marginalized, under-resourced, and so on. So um, that's knowledge when it comes to skills. Teaching to the test increasingly trumps instruction in critical thinking and skills for deliberation. So that's to do with the content, the actual explicit content of instruction that is pertinent to democratic education. Um, the context of democratic education. Habits, dispositions, the stuff of democratic character are difficult to teach. These are, however, influenced significantly by the context of learning. Um, it's tough to teach, you know, the stuff of character through a direct instruction. But we know that there are certain features of the context in which people are operating that influences their character in significant ways. Um, so Gordon Allport, Allport a famous um, hypothesis of his social psychologist in the 50s, um, states that the hypothesis is that, um, or it, it's, it's more, it's confirmed, it's still a hypothesis, I guess, but it's been um, one of the most uh, experimentally validated hypotheses in social psychology. Um, the contact hypothesis says, when contact occurs between people under certain conditions, um, it tends to reduce bias, um, stereotyping, intergroup uh, antipathy, um, and it tends to increase understanding and comfort with interacting with people. These are the dispositions that it should be sort of clear, um, are relevant to participating in the public sphere in this activity of conscious social reproduction. And um, a recent book by Elizabeth Anderson um, applies the contact hypothesis and other social scientific results, and she argues for an imperative, an educational imperative of integration. Um, equality of educational opportunity, in Anderson's view, requires, for we think good reasons, um, that contexts of learning are integrated across socially significant categories such as race, socioeconomic status, and ability status. So NCLB sanctions contribute to stratification by race, ability status, and other significant categories of sociocultural difference. Those um, policy instru instruments that I mentioned earlier, supplemental educational services and um, school choice policies, have contributed to the increase in stratification between and even within schools that we've seen since NCLB has been in effect. So um, we have four proposals that we came to out of this analysis. Um, do I have time to read through these real quick? OK. So we propose that um, federal education policy needs to move from a punitive to a participatory model for engaging local communities in reform efforts. Rather than threatening to withhold funding from struggling schools, provide additional support and incentives for staff, parents, and other community members to get involved in deliberating about educational problems and their solutions. Second, encourage the adoption by states and locales of curriculum standards that include a substantive focus on versus mere lip service to the knowledge, skills, and dispositions necessary for effective participation in a democratic society, and de-emphasize high-stakes testing of the basics, reading, writing, mathematics, as the exclusive focus of accountability measures. Third, curtail the privatization of public resources through supplemental education services and school choice. Keep individuals and organizations receiving public funds accountable to the public through democratic procedures and support elected school boards, which are the entities best positioned to exercise discretion in allocating education funding within firm guidelines based on democratic education's three limiting principles. And fourth and finally, seek ways to promote integrated schools in order to ensure access to equal educational opportunities and the diverse context of learning that all students need for the inculcation of democratic character. For instance, include enrollment constraints based on socially significant categories such as race as part of the school choice policy. So um, those are our proposals. A question we think about from time to time. Is this realistic at all these proposals we have given the current political climate and policy context? And thank you. <laughs>